Let's talk about what it takes to be an animal. Symmetry, embryonic development, and the body cavity. Next, we'll cover animal classification. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, all those traditional ranks. We'll also see how these ranks create a sort of nested hierarchy that fits in with many other unranked groups, including some major divisions within the animal kingdom. I'll also do a quick breakdown of how to read a phylogenetic tree or cladogram, and then we'll go for a bit of a tour of our major animal groups and all 30-something animal phyla. Metazoa, which is just another name for the kingdom Animalia, is a group that appeared a little more than 600 million years ago, diverging from a group of protists called opistocons. Most of the extant, the modern animal phyla that we have today, appeared in the Cambrian explosion, which was a massive adaptive radiation speciation event that began uh, about 539 million years ago. Now, before the Cambrian explosion, there were uh, invertebrate animals around. They were very strange animals, unlike anything that you might be familiar with from today. They included these weird-looking embryos, discs, bags, worm-like organisms, and I mean, we have a lot of worm-like organisms today, so maybe that wouldn't have been too strange. Uh, and then these quilted animals, which had strange body patterns that were based on fractal geometry, so kind of like a kaleidoscope almost. Now, there were some familiar groups too, like sponges and nadarians, possibly even some early mollusks, which does suggest that there may have been quite a few different animals around, that there was a broad amount of diversity in this Ediacaran period, this pre-Cambrian time. Now, over the past 635 or so million years, uh, there have probably been hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of millions of animal species, but most of these species have gone extinct, and today we have an estimated 10 million or so animal species on the planet, with about 1.7 million of those animal species having formal names. The most primitive phylum of extant, or living, metazoans, which, okay, was that fancy word for animals, this appears to be the sponges, phylum periphera. Sponges are asymmetrical animals. Unless you look down the tube of a sponge and maybe say it looks sort of symmetrical around this central cavity, uh, really sponges do not have any form of body symmetry. Now sponges do, like other animals, have their own specialized types of cells. Uh, with sponges, one of the most important ones are these collar cells that they use to create a current drawing in water through the pores in their sort of outer skin, quote unquote. Uh, and then there are nets around these cells that will trap food particles that were suspended in that water. Now, sponges do have complicated cells, and in many ways, these cells can communicate with each other, share nutrients and uh, function uh, as a group. But we do not consider sponges to be having true tissues because sponge tissues, these cells, lack a basement membrane underneath them. Uh, so we will just call them incipient tissues for now. But we'll return to this when we talk about sponges in another video. Uh, a couple of other very old groups are the comb jellies, phylum tenophora, and the flat animals in phylum placozoa, and the nadarians, which includes anemones and hydras and jellyfish. All of those are quite ancient groups, and with the exception of placozoa, which are just flat pancakes comprised of three layers of cells, these groups are all radially symmetric. And they have true tissues, although true tissues have been lost in Placozoa. They're just very simplistic animals. Uh, we'll talk about Placozoa too, because they're a very strange, puzzling group. They're very hard to sample and find. Uh, 
very interesting. Moving on. So this body symmetry we've been talking about, it's referring to the external or outside facing appearance of the animal. So we take a look down its longitudinal axis, this oral slash aboral mouth or butt axis. Radially symmetric animals can be mirrored across two or more planes that uh, transect this axis, that run through it while bilaterally symmetric animals can only be mirrored across a single plane running through this axis. Now, bilateral symmetry is often accompanied by something called polarity. So it's we have this direct oral, aboral, or anterior and posterior portions of the animal. Now, when sensory tissues and nervous tissues become concentrated at one end of the body, this is referred to as cephalization. Now, cephalization, this collection of tissues, is associated with directional movement, where this animal now tends to just move in that direction where all of its sensory structures are, its eyes, its uh, nose, all of that. It's going to move in that direction. There are three major planes that can be drawn through the body of a bilaterally symmetric animal. The first plane is the sagittal plane, and this is that mirror, the one that reflects the organism into left and right halves. The second plane is called the frontal or coronal plane, and it runs across this anteroposterior axis to split an organism into dorsal, back, and ventral front or tummy halves. Finally, the transverse plane. This plane is sometimes called an axial plane or cross-sectioned, and it divides the body into anterior and posterior regions, so front and back. Now, recognize that I've kind of used front in two different ways. As humans, we stand upright, so our front is also our ventral region, our stomach region whereas in most of our other animals, uh, they don't stand up on two feet, so their ventral region is much different than their front anterior region. Now, when we're referring to directions, anatomical direction, we do need to use a few standard terms so that no one gets lost, so that if you're comparing two different features, you can discuss which one is further away from the other one with regards to some reference point. When the reference point is the head, you may use the terms superior to say something's closer to the head or inferior, meaning it's further away from that point. When the reference point is the midline or the sagittal plane, we can use the terms lateral or medial. Lateral means further out to the left or right side, and medial means relatively close to that actual midline. Next, if we're referencing the trunk, so that core body of the organism, uh, we might use the terms proximal and distal. So this can refer to features that are located along a limb, something that actually sticks out from the trunk. So toes, for example, are a pretty distal feature compared to, say, maybe the waist, or the, the hips, or the, that joint where the leg actually connects to the trunk. Finally, as we start to sort of flay our animal and cut past the skin and look at the insides, we might use the terms superficial and deep. Superficial refers to anything that's located at or just below the surface, and then as we get further and further in, we use this term deep to reference that. Now, this concludes the sort of first part of this video where we're talking about body plan and we're talking about anatomy and anatomical direction. Now, we're going to take a look at embryonic development. Embryonic development in animals includes a few unique steps that we don't see in plants or fungi. After the gametes fuse, so after an egg is fertilized, the zygote will go through a few rounds of cell division without a period of growth between each division. So the size of the embryo 
doesn't change all that much despite the number of cells increasing geometrically. This process is called cleavage and eventually it produces a blastula, which is a hollow, fluid-filled ball of cells. This blastula is the first of these unique stages in animal embryonic development. Next, a small part of the surface will begin to fold inwards, creating an invagination with a small opening. This process is called gastrulation, and the space that results is the archenteron, or primitive gut. The opening is called the blastopore. In one major group of animals, the blastopore will eventually become the mouth, and in a second major group, the blastopore becomes the anus. This first group, with their mouths forming first, are aptly named the protostomes, a term that literally means first the mouth. The other group, which sees the mouth forming later, after the anus, we call them the deuterostomes, which means second comes the mouth. There are a few other key characteristics that differ between protostomes and deuterostomes. In deuterostomes, a four-cell embryo goes through radial cleavage to become an eight-cell embryo. This just means the cells are neatly aligned and sit directly on top of each other, like in the diagram here. And if during development, one or a few of these cells are broken off from the embryo, each one can successfully develop into a separate individual. This is because development is intermediate or regulative. Basically, none of the cells at this early stage are totally committed to a specific path yet. In protostomes, we have all the opposite. Most protostomes outside of a subgroup called the ectisozoa, which all molt in outer cuticle, most of these protostomes exhibit spiral cleavage, and not most in terms of number of species, because again, that would go to ectisozoa. Okay, so here, like with deuterostomes, we go from a four to eight cell embryo, but the process differs. So instead of having four cells sitting neatly on top of each other, uh, that upper layer of four cells is twisted or rotated around a bit so that they fit together more tightly with that bottom row. And as development continues, if one or a few cells are excised, they die. Arrested development. This is because in protostomes, embryonic development is mosaic or determinant. Early on, certain signaling molecules are accumulating in each cell, pushing them along a specific path, so they can't go and start over if they get lost. Through the process of gastrulation, our blastula has become a gastrula, and a gastrula has two embryonic tissue layers at first, an outer ectoderm and an inner endoderm. Later in development, this ectoderm will develop into the outer surface or epidermis of our animal and in many produce the entire nervous system. The digestive system, on the other hand, is derived from endoderm. Now, bilaterally symmetric organisms also have a third layer of embryonic tissue called the mesoderm. This mesoderm arises and typically lines that blastocil, retaining a fluid-filled cavity that is now referred to as a coelom. The skeletal and muscle systems can be derived from mesoderm, and this body cavity itself can have a variety of functions too, sometimes serving as a hydrostatic skeleton and sometimes providing an enhanced flexibility tube within a tube system for movement, or a storage space, in a way, for the internal organs. In diploblastic organisms, which are just a few, are radially symmetric 
uh, nidarians, uh, jellyfish anemones, our, our tenophora or comb jellies, they do have a non-living layer between their ectoderm and endoderm, and this non-living layer can sometimes have cells in it that are derived from one of the other layers, uh, but that non-living tissue itself is referred to as mesoglea, or the jelly in those jellyfish. Most of our bilaterally symmetric animals have mesoderm completely lining their coelom, that body cavity. When that's the case, it's a true coelom, and these animals are coelomate. The example pictured here is a polychaete, a type of segmented worm. If the mesoderm only partially lines that body cavity, we refer to those animals as pseudocelomate. They most certainly have a body cavity, but because it's not completely lined with mesoderm, we can't call it a true coelom. It's a pseudocelom. Nematodes, or roundworms, are a classic example of a pseudocelomate animal. And finally, we may have no body cavity at all. If mesoderm completely fills that space, this animal is referred to as acelomate, meaning without a body cavity. In this example, we see a large marine flatworm. And flatworms, or platyhelminths, are one of the most well-known acelomates. Before we talk about animal diversity, and in particular, the major groups of invertebrate animals, we need to talk about this old guy in the powdered wig. Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist and zoologist who developed a method of grouping species based on their morphology. Generally speaking, their physical appearance, their physiognomy, or just simple anatomy. Like a set of matryoshka, or Russian nesting dolls, each smaller group fits into progressively larger, more inclusive groups. Since Linnaeus published the first edition of his book Systema Naturae in 1736, taxonomists have recognized seven major taxa or taxonomic ranks. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Also, back in Linnaeus's time, there was no shorthand scientific name for a species. Each species was referred to by about a whole paragraph of confusing Latin terms. So Linnaeus found a way to make this much, much simpler. He proposed naming each species using a unique combination of two words, genus and species epithet. A genus refers to a particular group of organisms, so each name for a genus can only be used once, at least within a single kingdom. There are plenty of plants that have the same genus as an animal, but obviously they aren't members of the same group. Now, species epithets are just simple adjectives, and they can be used many times over as long as it's only used once in each genus. And when we write the name of a species, the genus and species epithet, both words need to be written in italics and only the genus, not the species epithet, is capitalized. Let's take a closer look at the organization of animals into hierarchical groups. In classical Linnaean taxonomy, the highest or most inclusive rank is phylum. So, of course, we're going to be focusing on the animal phylum, called Anomalia or Metazoa. Here, we have a massive diversity of life, ranging from near-microscopic zooplankton to lemurs to grasshoppers to massive blue whales. By moving down to the level of phylum, we'll be able to focus on the big groups, be they sponges or mollusks, or in our case here, the arthropods, arachnids, centipedes, crustaceans, insects, and other closely related groups. Continuing 
we might focus specifically on the class Insecta. Cockroaches, cicadas, butterflies, just many, many species. And out of all of them, I'd like to look at the order Hymenoptera. This order includes sawflies, ants, wasps, and bees. And we can focus, of course, on bees. Bees are one of the most charismatic ones. And out of these bees, uh, honeybees, bumblebees, orchid bees, and cuckoo bees, we'll pick the fuzziest and the buzziest, the bumblebees, genus Bombus. Out of the 250 or so species in this genus, let's pick one, the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus terrestris. We have now completed our hierarchical organization for one species. And we can see how as we move up and up to more inclusive ranks, that the number of species in each group increases and that diversity within each group increases as well. Of course, seven ranks just aren't enough to appreciate the morphological, behavioral, and ecological diversity we're seeing at each level. We need more ranks. For example, Hymenoptera is a really large and diverse order of insects. Normally, it contains the sawflies, ants, wasps, and bees, but sawflies, which are these stout little bugs that usually feed on trees or shrubs, well, maybe we want to exclude them because they're quite a bit different from the others. The suborder Apocrita does just that. Now we're only considering ants, wasps, and bees. We can even go one step further and specify ants, wasps, and bees that sting. This is what defines the infraorder Aculeata. And once more, before we get down to our family of bees, we can consider the superfamily Apoidae, which includes both bees and thread-waisted wasps, a very closely related group to our bees. Of course, if we need more, more ranks, we can always add them. There are only so many prefixes we can use, though, but it's certainly all right to include as many unranked groups as we want. They just don't fit in with one of the standard Linnaean names, they just won't have a name. You just kind of put them in as a ghost wherever you need them. The field of taxonomy deals with the naming and organization of species based on their similarities. Traditionally, Linnaeus and many other taxonomists have used morphological traits to group these species together. But more recently, we're relying on molecular traits. This is the modern approach, and it gets us much more accurate uh, portrayals of these relationships among species. Now, Charles Darwin's theory of common descent says that all organisms, living and extinct, can be traced back to a single common ancestor. These branching lineages form an evolutionary tree or phylogeny. Now, the lengths of the branches in these trees refer to time or some proxy of time, like uh, the number of base pair substitutions if we're looking at a, a molecular trait. A cladogram, though, just shows the topology of a phylogenetic tree, so just the relationships and those nested hierarchies. This is more of a, a flowchart or a kind of interaction diagram. Apart from just depicting relationships, a cladogram is a hypothesis about the relatedness of different groups. Characters or traits are used to place species in these nested groups, and we only consider homologous traits, traits that share an evolutionary history. This is in contrast with homoplastic traits, which have evolved independently, typically through convergent evolution. Like the wings of a bird or the wings of a butterfly, they evolve more by coincidence, probably due to similar selective pressures or the adaptive value of those traits. Species that share a derived trait, so traits that vary, that are different from the ancestral state, altogether 
they form a clade, a cohesive group or branch of the evolutionary tree. Valid taxonomic ranks meet these criteria. For example, the derived traits of arthropods include a pair of jointed appendages on each segment, and these segments are often fused into functional groups called tegmata. Before I continue, there's one minor clarification I'd like to make about some of the terms here. A character is a specific feature, while a character state is the condition that a character takes. For example, the number of toes on the hind limb is a character, and the five toes in humans, three in rhinos, and one in horses are character states. Now would be a good time to review the anatomy of a phylogenetic tree or cladogram. Many trees are rooted, which basically tells us that all of the taxa in this tree descend from a common ancestor. In our tree, we also have an outgroup, which we use to infer the ancestral state of the derived characters that are being studied in our in-group. Remember, the arthropods are a clade or monophyletic group containing a common ancestor and all of its descendants. As we scan down the right side of this tree, we can read off the names of each taxon, spiders, crabs, water fleas, and so on. These taxa are located at terminal nodes. In a way, they're the leaves on our phylogenetic tree. Often, these leaves are species, but they can also be larger groups if we're more interested in, say, macroevolutionary trends. When two groups are more closely related to each other than they are to the others in a tree, we call these sister groups. And tracing back each group, we can find our most recent common ancestors located at each node. The branches themselves represent lineages. Sometimes a group might exclude a subset of its descendants. For example, insects aren't generally considered to be crustaceans, even though they evolved from within that group. This means that crustaceans, without insects, would be paraphyletic and therefore an invalid taxon. But considering insects separate from crustaceans is certainly fair, considering how different those two groups are. Anyway, as we start looking at more complex cladograms or trees, oftentimes we're unable to parse out the exact relationships among all of our groups. We might know that they share a common ancestor, but there are still missing links. These unresolved relationships are drawn out as is. So instead of one common ancestor for each pair of lineages, we have a tie with three or more lineages sharing one ancestor. This is called a polytomy, and in our cladogram, it looks like a pitchfork or a starburst. It's time to go over our current understanding of invertebrate taxonomy. There are currently 31 recognized phyla. Well, 30 if you exclude the chordates. But these numbers can and probably will change in the future. We have so much more to learn about the relationships among these phyla. And fortunately, with the modern advent of molecular technologies, we've been able to unlock a few secrets. But of course, along the way, we're running into many more questions and puzzles. It might surprise you that we don't know the oldest living animal group. Sponges might be the obvious choice, but they've also been on their own for hundreds of millions of years. It's possible their ancestors were more complex than they are today. Regardless, among the oldest animals, we have sponges and comb jellies, as well as flat animals and nadarians. Except for the sponges, all of these groups are diploblastic. At least they were originally. The flat animals have since lost their tissues. 
As we move up our tree, we'll see that all of our triploblastic animals form a clade called bilateria, and these are our bilaterally symmetric animals. The most primitive animals in this group are the xenoturbellids and acelomorphs. All the rest belong to one of two lineages, the protostomes or deuterostomes, which are treated as sister groups here. But because deuterostomes seem to have retained more ancestral states, let's look at them first. Deuterostomes include the hemichordates, acorn worms and kin, echinoderms, sea stars, sea urchins, and the phylum chordata, which includes us, the vertebrates. Moving on to the protostomes, you should notice that there are two main branches. This first clade is called ectisozoa, and their name refers to their molted outer cuticle. In many, this cuticle is very hard and tough, functioning as an exoskeleton. The largest phylum in the ectisozoa is arthropoda, and within it, we have spiders and kin, crustaceans, including insects, and the myriapods, centipedes and millipedes. The other major protostome clade is called spiralia. Members of this group, at some point, exhibited spiral cleavage during their early embryonic development. This trait has been modified or lost in many descendants. Sometimes the name Lophotrochozoa is used instead of spiralia, but this term really just applies to mollusks, segmented worms, horseshoe worms, moss animals, and their immediate relatives. These are animals with a trochophore larva or a ciliated crown called a lophophore, hence this name. There are a few other big groups of spiralian protostomes, like Nathifera, which includes the arrowworms, jawworms, rotifers, and micronathozoans. As we continue with this course, we'll revisit some of these groupings. For now, focus on the major clades that I've highlighted here. I also have this version of my phylogenetic tree listing scientific names instead of common names. As invertebrate biologists, you'll need to know both. Going forward, I'll usually use both names so you can hear them and make these associations. Anyway, that's about it for this video. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe, leave a comment, send me a message, whatever you want to do. I'll be posting more videos featuring each invertebrate phylum and lots of interesting and weird animals that you can find in each one. Until next time.